Thanks everyone for joining us. We're going to give people another couple of minutes to filter in, and so we'll get started in a couple of in a couple of minutes. But uh, thanks so much for being here, and uh, we'll get started shortly. Okay, I think we'll get started now. Um, thank you uh, very much. Thanks to everybody for joining us here today. Uh, my name is Joshua Tucker. I'm the director of the Jordan Center for the Advanced Study of Russia and a professor of politics at NYU. Um, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you to the uh, this meeting of the New York City Russia Public Policy Seminar Series, which is co-hosted with the Harriman Institute of Columbia and generously supported by the Carnegie Corporation of New York. Um, I will just address Briefly, before we get started, the elephant in the room. This is obviously a weird time to be talking about Russia uh, and, and having an event that's not focused on what's going on with Russia and Ukraine. And, uh, and our decision here is that, you know, at the Jordan Center, our goal is to support the study of, and the understanding of all things Russia. And while Russia is very much in the news, uh, in the short term, dealing with what's going on in Ukraine and, and, and our, and our heart, uh, thoughts and go out to everybody there who is potentially affected by this, uh, in all sides of the conflict, and we are all hoping for a peaceful resolution. Uh, there are still many other issues that are that are very, very important, and 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 we as academic institutions need to continue to fulfill our mission to support the study of Russia. So today we're going to talk about something that has tremendous uh, both short-term, medium-term, and long-term implications for Russia and for the rest of the world, both the near abroad and the entire rest of the world, which is the subject of environmental activism uh, in Russia. And so just to give all of you who are joining us for the first time a sense of how these uh, programs work, the New York City Russia Public Policy uh, Program aims to bring together scholars and often practitioners to talk about important public policy issues that are facing Russia and Russia society. Uh, and the way we'll work today is we have five uh, very uh, distinguished and interesting speakers who will talk to us today. And the process will be they'll each speak, and my colleague from the Harriman Institute, Elise Giuliano, will introduce each of the speakers in turn. She'll, in order to keep the flow going, she'll introduce people before they speak. So we'll have short bios before they speak, and we'll have longer bios that we'll put in the chat, um, which those of you who are joining us on Zoom can access on the chat. Those of us who are uh, joining us on YouTube will also post links to where the bios can be found on YouTube as well. Uh, while the speakers are speaking, you should feel free to use the Q&A button on your Zoom, uh, on your Zoom uh, panel, as well as on YouTube, you could just use the comments button to leave questions. It's a Zoom webinar, as I'm sure most of you are familiar with by now. So we won't be calling on you to ask your questions, but Elise and I will choose questions from the Q&A. The nice thing about the Q&A setup is that you can ask them at any time. So feel free to leave questions while the, questions, while the speakers are speaking. We will go through all of the speakers in turn. We've asked them to talk for about eight to 10 minutes. And then afterwards, we'll turn to the Q&A and Elise and I will pose your questions uh, to the panelists at that time. And we'll wrap up by 1.30 p.m. Eastern time. So thank you all once again for joining us. A huge thanks as well uh, to Carly Jackson and to Sasha Spitalnik who are doing the behind the scenes work here. And I also wanna give out a, a huge shout out to Sasha Spitalnik, who is the program administrator of the Jordan Center, who actually planned today's event and reached out for the speakers. And Sasha will be asking the first question after the speakers have talked. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Elise Giuliano to uh, introduce our speakers and to run the, the pr presentations from the speakers section of this. Elise. Thank you, Josh. Uh, thanks to everyone for coming and especially to our panelists, because this is actually very timely 
and it almost feels like the rest of the um, Russian studies world is kind of catching up to the environmental movement in Russia as attention is increasingly focused around the world on environmental issues. So we're going to cover a, a lot of a really um, 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 many different aspects of what environmentalists activists have been doing in Russia over the years. Um, and we are lucky to have, as Josh said, both activists and um, academics who specialize on the topic. Okay, so uh, without further ado, I am happy to introduce our first speaker, who is Elizabeth Planton. I'd like, like to just tell you a little bit about her. She's an assistant professor of political science at Stetson University. Previously, she was a China public policy postdoctoral fellow at the Ash Center for Democratic Governance at Harvard uh, University, at Harvard's Kennedy School uh, from 2018 to 2020. And her research focuses on environmental activism and authoritarian politics in China and in Russia. Her work has been published or is forthcoming in the journals Russian Politics, Comparative Politics, and Post-Soviet Affairs, among other places. Uh, Elizabeth? Thank you for that introduction. I'm going to pull up some slides to get started. Um, I'm really excited for the opportunity and, and look forward to the conversation and discussion. Uh, as was already mentioned, those of us that are here have been studying environmental politics in Russia for a long time. And so it's, it's very exciting that um, it, there's renewed interest uh, in, this, in this topic recently. So I'll give a very brief overview of the evolution of environmental activism in Russia before pivoting to some new analysis of how environmental activists interact with party politics in Russia. So over the last several years, we've seen a rise in environmental activism in Russia and is probably the motivation for a panel like this. There have been major campaigns that have dotted the headlines from fighting forest fires to protecting green spaces from construction projects to opposing landfills and waste incineration plants across Russia's regions. Pictured here is a protest against shipping all of Moscow's waste to a landfill in Shias, a town in northern Russia, in 2019. The sign says, no to Moscow trash in the Russian north. But where did these movements come from? They didn't um, just sprout up in the last couple of years. Environmental protests in Russia may now be dotting the headlines more than they used to, but environmental activism in Russia and the Soviet Union has a long history. So I briefly wanted to summarize some of those main uh, points throughout history. During the Soviet Union, there were environmental movements, particularly around Lake Baikal in the 1960s, but a major catalyst for the late Soviet environmental movement was the Chernobyl accident and the strong anti-nuclear movement that followed. This really set up the environmental movement to be in a strong position at the end of the Soviet Union, even amid the political, economic, and social chaos of the 1990s. This was also a period of time in which many contemporary Russian environmental NGOs were formed, often with the help of foreign funding. Uh, they went through this period of benign neglect, as it's been called, in the 1990s, where the state was neither making things more difficult nor making it easier for them to operate. That started to change in the 2000s as uh, the state began to reassert control over civil society in general, not just over environmental activism, with the rise of Putin in the 2000s. Al Evans has covered this shift really well. And while there were some larger environmental protests in the mid 2000s, such as a movement to uh, protect Lake Baikal from an oil pipeline in 2006, there was a movement to protect Timki Forest from a highway in 2010 that really served as another catalyst for the Russian environmental movement, particularly in urban areas. That movement also coincided with the 2011-2012 Russian election protests for fair elections, which kicked off an increased interest in election monitoring and electoral politics for many active Russian citizens, including environmental activists. So over the last decade, we've really seen the environmental movement in Russia gain higher levels of public attention and participation. Although the state has largely neglected or repressed it, um, pushing activists to remain informal. Uh, one of the other panelists will talk about the foreign agent law. Some of my work has also looked at the effects of the foreign agent law and how it may be encouraging environmental NGOs to uh, deregulate, uh, to operate informally and to rely more on mass movements to gain the attention of the authorities. But it has also created additional opportunities and incentives for environmentalists to start working with formal political parties. So I'm going to focus on that piece today, again, with this major motivation being a connection between environmental activists and party politics as arising after the 2011-2012 protests for fair elections. So the protests around contested elections and authoritarian regimes have been really well covered in the political science literature. 
Um, existing studies have established why we should expect there to be mass mobilization around the electoral calendar. Scholars have also argued that there are increased incentives for opposition political parties to recruit activists from local social movements to their cause in order to sustain that wave of mobilization beyond the electoral calendar. And third, as Yana Gorohovskaya's work has shown us, there's evidence of this happening in Russia, particularly after the 2011-2012 electoral protests, where opposition parties were often recruiting local activists who already had a base of support. However, those trends have largely been studied from the, the viewpoint of opposition parties or opposition activists themselves, and there's been less from the point of view of those activists that are being recruited. So why would those activists join opposition parties? What would be the advantages and disadvantages of engaging in formal, for, formal party politics? And certainly as it relates to this panel and to my own work, I answer this question by looking at the example of environmental activism in Russia. So ultimately, I find through this research that environmentalists are caught between two main tensions. On the one hand, political parties can provide resources, support, and some degree of protection. But on the other hand, working with political parties can sacrifice local legitimacy, distract from the original movement goals, and even create divisions among movement members. As a result, I think that activist cooperation with political parties will be widespread in the short term. We'll see quite a lot of it. Perhaps it could be useful or iterative for political parties, but the ties not, might not be long lasting. So for this presentation, I wanted to illustrate this connection between environmental activists and political parties in Russia through two major case studies, one in Moscow and one in St. Petersburg. These two are really most likely cases for seeing connections between the opposition and local activists. Data is drawn from over 90 interviews that I've done with stakeholders in Russia from 2015 to 2021, um, mostly physically in Russia, but in 2020 and 2021, those were remote, focusing on formal and informal environmental groups. So as mentioned earlier, as a first case, I focus on this movement to protect Team Key Forest. The leader who's pictured here, Yevgenia Chirikova, helped to organize a grassroots movement to stop a highway from being constructed through the middle of Himki Forest, which is a forest um, in a northwest Moscow suburb. At its height in August 2010, this movement attracted 5,000 people to a mass concert rally in Moscow, which at the time was quite impressive before the electoral um, mass mobilization had happened. But what's perhaps less well known about this particular movement is that Chirikova ran for mayor of Himki twice. And she also forged really strong connections to opposition parties like Yablika and individual opposition leaders like Boris Nemtsov, Alexei Navalny, and Ilya Yashin. She's pictured here on the slide in the second picture with Navalny in Himki Forest in 2011, uh, where she hosted an anti seliger opposition camp. She also became really active as a leader of the opposition for the protest movement later in 2011 through 2013. So even though the highway was eventually built and Chirikova was forced to leave for Estonia in 2015, which one of the other panelists will also discuss today, those ties to the opposition political parties had lasting effects for those other activists that were involved in the Hinki movement. So in interviews with those activists, I found that that those activists continued to forge strong ties to opposition political parties. Some of them went on to serve as election observers in 2011 and 2012 and beyond. And some later decided to run for local office as candidates for opposition parties, mostly with the help of Yablika. This wasn't just happening in Himki or just in Moscow, but it was also happening in St. Petersburg. So the 2011-2012 wave of electoral protests also created opportunities for political party and environmental movement collaboration. I'm looking here at a second case of Krasimir Ronsky and his movement, Beautiful Petersburg. Ronsky also became involved in, uh, became an election monitor after the December 2011 protests. And then he got the idea to start this larger group, Beautiful St. Petersburg, to hold local officials accountable to citizens regarding reports of environmental violations and municipal level complaints. He had never really planned to get involved in politics, had been satisfied with his group, but in February 2019, he announced that he was running as a candidate for governor of St. Petersburg. He wasn't able to pass the municipal filter and wasn't able to get on the ballot but he began helping other environmental activists around St. Petersburg run for local office through Petersburg Green Coalition. Um, and some of those activists had also helped from United Democrats and Navalny's Smart Voting Initiative. 
This is also not limited to Moscow and St. Petersburg. In addition to those, we're seeing many examples of environmental activists running with Yablaka or other opposition parties or as independents in local and gubernatorial elections. One final example shows Oleg Mandrikin on the slide, who's a leader of an environmental social movement in Arhangelsk with the support of the broader Stop Shias coalition that was mentioned on the slide earlier. And he was put forth to be their candidate for regional governor in 2020. In 2020, he was also not able to get through the municipal filter and was not able to get on the ballot. But in September 20, 2021, he was able to run for Duma as a Yablica candidate and got on the ballot, coming in second to the United Russia candidate. So through these cases, I wanted to illustrate both the advantages and disadvantages for activists of being involved. They get increased resources for working with parties, increased and higher level media attention, and the ability to hold rallies as a part of their campaign. For a lot of activists that I talked to, they weren't necessarily that interested in winning, um, but using the resources of the party to help further their causes. In terms of drawbacks, however, there's many disadvantages. Sometimes being involved with political parties could decrease local legitimacy for activists, it could distract from original movement goals, or it could even create divisions within the movement. We saw this within the Himki movement um, and Chirikova's decision to run for mayor and later join the elite of the Moscow opposition that alienated, alienated some of the supporters in the movement who either wanted to stay apolitical or didn't support the opposition. Similarly with beautiful St. Petersburg, although many of those local environmental and urban activists were running for office in 2019, not all all of those candidates even agreed with the decision of other activists to join parties. So there's one um, quote here on the slide that I wanted to read. Um, People who are exclusively obsessed with politics, they are to me not civic activists, obsessioniki, but enemies. We are never going to work together in any way. I am running myself right now, but we are not going to work with parties. Those people uh, those are people who are motivated by political interests. So this is someone who is even running for municipal council in St. Petersburg who distrusted political parties this much. And so in conclusion, I would expect that the, the prospects for environmental activists as a major supply of opposition party candidates is mixed in Russia. These collaborations will likely continue. We'll see environmental activists run for local elections and work with political parties. I'm really excited to see what happens with the upcoming Moscow municipal elections for that reason. Um, but even as more environmental activists run for local elections, it doesn't necessarily mean that they'll become stable party members. A lot of them are you know, using this as, as a largely instrumental way to further their environmental causes, and there's few sort of true believers in the party. Um, so that concludes my remarks for, for this panel, and I, I look forward to the other panelists' presentations and our discussion. Thank you, Elizabeth. Now I'm happy to introduce Anatoly Lebedev, who is the chairman of the regional NGO Bureau for Regional Outreach Campaigns based in Vladivostok, known by its acronym VROC. Uh, this NGO coordinates international and regional projects aimed at expanding environmental education and supporting initiatives in the fields of sustainable nature management and ballast development on indigenous territories and within indigenous communities. Lebedev has worked as an environmental journalist and act analyst since 1995, focusing on forest use, the timber market, and civil society-led sustainable development initiatives. Since 2001, he has served as editor-in-chief of Ecology and Business, a quarterly magazine covering re resource use trends and environmental issues in Russia, in the Russian Far East and Siberia. The journal is distributed to regional experts, companies, academics, students, and activists throughout the area. David Dev is a member of several regional, national, and international professional associations, including Sosnovka, a regional coalition of NGOs working on environmental protection of the Russian Far East and Siberia, as well as a member of Russian Socio-Ecological Socio Union, the Global Forest Coalition, and the Russian Association of Environmental Journalists, among others. In 2012, he was named a United Nations Forest Hero. Anatoly? Okay, thank you. Okay, dear colleagues, I'm just uh, in this webinar uh, represent uh, the most active, sustainable, professional and uh, fruitful environmental NGO coalition of the North Asia. It is a so coalition, as you already said, of environmental and indigenous NGOs, which unite about 50 local groups and leaders from uh, the Far East and Siberia with a common target to keep our unique environment and resources in the process of increasing economic, 
uh, exploitation in favor of Moscow concern monopolies and foreign investors. Sosnovka is a, a network and a family with no adopted leader and its authority and expertise is seriously strengthened uh, by the uh, long active participation of our leading national of uh, our leading national NGOs, Greenpeace and WWF. Each group of uh, Sosnovka and member NGO in uh, coalition uh, has its own mode of conduct, strategy and collab of collaboration with uh, regional authorities. Uh, <clears throat> we used uh, to meet uh, offline every year during 25 years in different sites of our West region until uh, COVID um, pandemia and continue now. Our NGO Brock, Bureau of Regional Outreach Campaigns, uh, play in this coalition the role of history keeper. Since um, 1995, we produced um, our TV shows uh, preserved for Primoria, and since uh, 2001, published quarterly uh, non commercial journal, um, regional uh, journal for Siberian Paris, Ecology and Business which reflect the dynamics and uh, the key problems of the Far East Siberia uh, on conservation, indigenous rights, protected areas, forestry, mining, fisheries, wildlife, land and waste management, climate change, energy, uh, territorial development, etc. Currently, uh, we are, um, implement a partnership uh, journalistic project on exchange publication with our colleagues from Earth Island Journal in San Francisco. <clears throat> Regarding environmental movement uh, of our region during uh, 30 years of new capitalistic Russia, I have to say that uh, all that movement uh, here appeared and uh, was developed in um, was and uh, was developed to exist in professional uh, level exclusively thanks to our great friendly and financial support of our colleagues from United States. <clears throat> Usually, <clears throat> initially it was uh, the famous Institute for Soviet American Relation, ISAR, uh, from Washington DC, which uh, decided to create a series of uh, branches in Vladivostok, Novosibirsk and Moscow. And I was one of uh, their consultant in 1991 <clears throat> for that. Our Foreston branch was established in 1994 uh, after a Russian uh, anti-communist coup in 1993. But um, to that time, our local groups uh, already uh, appeared in Kamchatka, Primorye, Khabarovsk, Baikal, and Altai, and uh, collaborated with our main partners of American West Pacific Environment, Earth Island Institute, and Wild Salmon Center. Our new uh, friends mm, brought us uh, to us uh, their experience in conservation, activism, legal, financial, and technical support helped to develop contacts with uh, the main global green and international NGOs, Greenpeace, WWF, uh, Friends of the Earth. Our ground, <clears throat> our group of, of support Greenpeace at the Russian Far East was uh, active in Vladivostok since 1990 when our only um, our city was still closed we contacted with a greenpeace activist uh, from <clears throat> usa and you and united kingdom in nahotka and once um, and since they uh, and since that time in 1992 we organized the first first famous greenpeace action in russia um, against nuclear contamination of our seas and uh, destructive logging on the North Primoria with Greenpeace and uh, uh, flagship uh, Rainbow Warrior. During all 90s, our local <coughs> groups uh, appeared and um, uh, developed thanks to our great um, coordinators, David Gordon in Pacific Environment and Gary Cook in Earth Island. And um, after uh, 1997, Gordon launched uh, uh, the great uh, project uh, founded Sosnovka Coalition, and we registered our NGO Brock in Vladivostok as a community of journalists, experts, and activists. 
one of the most uh, famous and um, efficient Russian NGO, Sakhalin Environmental Watch, were created uh, a bit later in 1999 on the uh, on the um, broad scale uh, protesting campaign against a huge offshore oil gas drilling in Sakhalin Northeast. Uh, it is important to um, understand that um, our great movement here at the Far East and Siberia grew uh, by the period of uh, as entire uh, movement of the North Pacific, together with indigenous groups and association and our American uh, neighbors. <clears throat> we used uh, a regular direct flights from Vladivostok to San Francisco via Alaska. Uh, we had a U.S. consulate here and in, in, in the Russian consulate there in San Francisco, and we used uh, to visit California much more, much more often than Moscow. Although the mm, the flight time was actually the equal to to the west to Moscow and to east to San Francisco from us, um, and this. Uh, the key point of our American partners were much more, um, much, were much more interest uh, for our, for our activism and uh, for uh, working with our problems, and, and they could support us much more than anyone in Moscow. Uh, our um, national and um, regional government at that time were mainly busy with uh, creation new uh, private monopolies uh, based on nature resources of Far East and Siberia, mainly concentrated on traditional lands of uh, indigenous people, Evenki, <clears throat> Udege, Nanai, Karyak, Buyat, etc. So we had no choice but to contradict uh, that kind of uh, barbarian development uh, by um, all uh, available uh, civil tools via media, uh, protesting activities, and legal work. In our uh, legislature work uh, on the uh, regional level, which um, many of us were involved in, we naturally uh, preferred uh, to use United States legal experience than European one, which we were uh, enforced uh, with from Moscow. Our national and fruitful uh, Trans-Pacific and Java collaboration began to fall step, step by step since 2000, when come, with coming two new presidents to power, Bush and uh, Putin. They cut um, direct flights from far, far East to yes, um, uh, uh, crucially reduced the volume of uh, grants uh, for our NGOs from US foundations, closed um, both consulate in Vladivostok and San Francisco. The most destructive um, shot uh, for our green movement uh, was done with adoption in uh, 20, uh, 2012, 2012 of anti-constitutional um, law of foreign agents, uh, target to uh, exclusively um, destroy and um, liquidate most active part of civil society, including environmental and indigenous NGOs, traditionally funded by US um, charitable resources. The impact of, uh, on our green uh, movement from this um, was uh, various. Uh, some NGO were uh, liquidated, some uh, turned to commercial mode or changed to, uh, to change their name. Some activists, began to work uh, as private experts. We were officially recognized uh, civil entities uh, like public front and um, public uh, councils under governmental agencies. Some great uh, indigenous um, leaders uh, had um, even uh, to leave country under scary governmental pressure. But now we are uh, all still mm, strong and alive, and uh, we hope uh, that uh, we hope to see the next wave of our Trans-Pacific uh, mm, Civil Bridge to uh, re to um, re return our brilliant, friendly relations with American West. Actually, that's it from my side. So, if there are any questions later, thank you. Thank you, Anatoly.
Great. Okay. Um, now uh, I am happy to turn to our next speaker, Maria Tisichniuk, who is chair of the Environmental Sociology Group at the Center for Independent Social Research in St. Petersburg and a senior researcher at the University of Eastern Finland in Joensuu. Uh, Tisichniuk holds a MS in Environmental Studies from Bard College a PhD in biology from the Russian Academy of Sciences and a PhD in sociology from Vyingen University. She has taught at Herzen Pedagogical University in St. Petersburg, St. Petersburg State University, Johns Hopkins University, Dickinson College, Rampo College of New Jersey, Towson University, Wagen University, and University of Lapland and University of Eastern Finland, and Erfurt University. Since 2004, she studied global governance through FSC certification. In 2012, she started extensive research on transnational oil production chains in the Arctic. Tisichnuk has written more than 250 publications, wow, on topics related to transnational environmental governance, She's edited several books and has had fieldwork experience in several countries and regions. Maria. Thank you very much for your invitation. I'm very excited to talk in such wonderful panel. And I will focus today on how environmental NGOs are coping with the law on foreign agents. You all know that we have our President Putin since the year 2000, and the most of pressure on civil society, as Anatoly mentioned, started in 2012. So I will talk a little bit about the federal law on foreign agents uh, and the law on undesirable organizations, and I will explain how uh, NGOs operation in Russia and their networks changed because of these laws and what strategies have Russian NGOs, uh, environmental NGOs employed to cope with this uh, tightening state regulation. Uh, NGOs can be listed as foreign agents if they have foreign funding and if they do some of the political activities. But the political activity is understood very widely it means that even organizers of seminars, workshops, conferences, the participation of individual me members in some public meetings, criticizing authorities, publishing articles, all this is political activities. So in early years, it was very several strange situations when NGOs, which were very far from politics, were getting into the list of foreign agents. For example, the NGO Dront uh, just received the money from the uh, Russian Orthodox Church. And uh, it turns out that Russian Orthodox Church was channeling money through Cyprus, and then they become foreign agents. So he was saying, um, are you a foreign agent now? He says, oh no, I am an agent of Patriarch Kirill. Uh, the repressive legislation developed over years. Now, in 2017, uh, media can become foreign agent. In 2021, uh, it was not allowed for NGOs, foreign agents to be involved in education. And then we are expecting that in March, uh, every foreign agent NGO will need to uh, that present a program of all their activities and get it approved before implementing. And uh, then it is a very scary law in um, uh, 2021 when about individual foreign agents. Now, individual foreign agents can become different bloggers, alternative media. And as for now, we have only one environmentalist in Geni Simonov who is a coordinator of Rivers Without Borders, who become the first, uh, the first individual foreign agent. And usually it turns out that foreign agents, individuals are leaving the country. If we look at how uh, environmental NGOs are compared to others are included in the registry. So in blue, uh, it's shown all, uh, all NGOs in the registry and in uh, orange environmental NGOs. So you can see that like the peak of inclusion to the agency was in 2015, uh, then it was a little bit less, and in uh, 2019 only two NGOs were listed. Uh, 
Uh, it means that in total, uh, 260 NGOs in the register, there was 32 environmental NGOs, 12%. But then it become less NGOs in the register, 75 now, and only three environmental, so 5%. But what happens? Uh, it happens that NGOs officially are liquidating, but unofficially they continue to operate. Uh, here, the, this graph is all about environmental NGOs, and in blue is uh, like uh, inclusion in the register, in the uh, orange is liquidating themselves, and this kind of gray is uh, just uh, staying in the register. And we see this orange is very high, so NGOs prefer to liquidate officially and then change its form and adjust to the legislation and continue operation on one or other forms. How they do this? What strategies are they employing? First, some of them just are rejecting foreign funding or returning foreign funding. No, for example, Sakhalin Environmental Watch that Anatoly mentioned, they just returned all foreign funding which they had, and after two years, they could get off the register. They couldn't get off the register right away because they already spent from their grant some of this money and it was used. Uh, some uh, NGOs are engaged in different kind of informal agreements with the, the Ministry of Justice through their personal connections. And they, here are some citations. So they can agree about lower penalty or just uh, bargain a little bit with them. But uh, they cannot really avoid listed, uh, being listed in the, uh, foreign, um, uh, in the registry if um, they are supposed to. Uh, by authorities. Uh, no, as I told, many of them are li liquidating and then restructuring. Some of them are diversifying the organization. One uh, like non-commercial, other one commercial. Uh, but those um, uh, in cases where uh, the same leaders were uh, in both, then they, got, uh, they were getting in trouble everywhere. So now if they are diversifying the organization, they try to um, um, create boards which are very different in both organizations and leaders with different names. Some of them just close the organization and form commercial organization. And this is pretty safe. For now, so many environmental NGOs are trying to do that, but then they have huge trouble with getting foreign funding because charitable foundations usually are funding non-commercial organizations. And then those who left Russia, some of them are acting from abroad and Laura will retell more about that. Uh, what, was, what is interesting here that some environmental NGOs are really cooperating with the government in their activities and for that are getting to the uh, register of foreign agents uh, very often. Uh, some of them, uh, like uh, in recent years, developed effective strategies, how to avoid that. For example, one of the NGO AETAS closed itself when become a foreign agent and then uh, it's just kind of getting uh, money from the Norwegian Foundation through the factory, which is doing recycling. Uh, so it looks like the uh, uh, Norwegian partner is investing in the recycling factory. And then the recycling factory has absolutely different agreements on services with the NGO. And NGO is studying ocean pollution. Uh, but and in this way, for the uh, it is very hard to determine how uh, the money is channeled through that. Uh, some uh, there are now uh, lots of lots of um, environmental NGOs are um, formed by the state agencies, and they are uh, gongos, like government organized non government organizations, which are fake organizations, but some real good environmental organizations uh, do the same. 
For example, um, Kinazirsky National Park formed the organization friend of the park, Kinazirye, uh, and they get lots and lots of foreign grants. They are very much worrying when the Ministry of Justice is there, but the, it's all work out because the, the Ministry of Justice used to um, such NGOs formed by the government. So they are kind of knowing that money is coming from abroad, but just thinking that that is fine. And they have the same leaders. In the Kinazeria National Park, the director is at the same time direct, um, head of the uh, friends of the Park Kinazeria NGO. So there are many uh, NGOs which are continuing to re uh, receiving foreign money. We are using absolutely different diverse strategies. There are very few in the register, only three, but those who are continuing getting money, there is a lot through different associations, through commercial partners, uh, through registering as individual entrepreneurs, um, so, through re renaming projects that it can be determined as uh, foreign funding and uh, like money coming from abroad to individual accounts. Uh, so, uh, and some NGOs are openly working with foreign funding and are not in the register. For example, WWF and Greenpeace. No, Greenpeace is registered abroad, so it can be only undesirable, but WWF uh, is as usually dis receiving huge amount from abroad. And if they give small grants to the smaller NGOs, smaller NGOs are getting to the register, but WWF does not. I was trying to investigate that, and there are many uh, kind of explanations by different actors why it happened. So the government depends very much in different conventions on the reports which WWF is doing for that. And also they still think, of, the government still is thinking about the image of the country. It's impossible, uh, feeling impossible to uh, list WWF as foreign agent. Uh, of course, the law on foreign agents transformed environmental NGOs um, a lot. It is a huge administrative and financial expense. Uh, then it, uh, NGOs become less active and less public, those who are uh, scared, those with foreign funding, I mean. Uh, then in the society, it, uh, there is a lot of negative attitudes towards NGOs uh, that are getting foreign money. So they are trying not to acknowledge their money received and just pretend that this money is like initiative or membership or whatever. Uh, then the networks are restructured a lot and then formed new partners between civil rights defenders and environmental NGOs because uh, just it's kind of the uh, which never existed before. Uh, the second law, which just changed uh, the whole field of the environmental operations, uh, uh, is the law on undesirable organizations, which were introduced, which was introduced in 2015. And those, in, it was organizations who represent threat to constitutional regime, uh, to national security, and collaboration with the undesirable organization is really, really dangerous because it can be not only administrative penalties, but even um, prison punishment. Uh, so uh, I would say that if um, environmental NGOs are very successful in, in adjusting to the law on foreign agents, they try to stop collaboration with the undesirable organization because it is so unsafe, but some still continue, but I will not talk about them. Uh, there are uh, 50 undesirable organizations. The most striking is that Pacific Environment, uh, the NGO uh, who done like a lot in Far East, Anatoly was talking about it, is uh, um, also undesirable organization. And even Bard College, which I graduated from, also is undesirable. So I even cannot give public talks there or keep correspondence with them. And recently German Russian exchange who was uh, getting European Union grant for climate education and had, had partners, environmental NGO partners in St. Petersburg and Arhangelsk Oblast needed to be closed uh, before uh, it ended just because uh, 
the major grant receiver was German Russian Exchange, which became an undesirable organization. Um, so now it's less and less uh, funders in Russia. Some of them just leave not to become uh, undesirable. Some of them are also adjusted. They changed a lot their eligibility criteria. Some of them started to fund profit organizations, especially in Norwegian. Um, Society for Nature Protection is um, very good in that. Uh, they not always require a partnership like European Union before was trying uh, every grant to be uh, shared with lots of partners. But now if a foreign agent shares, then uh, they become foreign agents. Consulates started to give grants. And then some foundation just stopped asking for acknowledgement. Now, when I ask how we thank you, they say just you don't have to thank you. And we even rename the projects. Uh, which um, cannot really uh, get to the point that um, it is recognizable uh, because we still published on the web a lot, but we don't name the project as it is um, really in the with funding agency. So to conclude, just lo global local interplay of actors changed a lot. Uh, there are now new rules of the game uh, and uh, just the environmental NGOs are disconnected with their fondi, uh, former funding agencies. They find new funding agencies and some uh, manage to maintain old networks. Then there is absolutely different network with state officials now and agencies within Russia. Uh, and um, uh, NGOs try to go through info informal games uh, with um, formal laws. Uh, lots of litigation. Before there was much less litigation than now. And now there are new transnational networks of civil rights defenders now which are cooperating with environmental NGOs. So total global local institutional field changed a lot because of this repressive legislation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Maria. Okay, now we will um, hear from Christian Rinchinov, who is the founder and CEO of the US-based nonprofit Baigali, a member of the Buryat Regional Union on Lake Baikal and the Russian Social Ecological Union. Christian started volunteering for environmental causes when he was a teenager. Then environmental movement and conservation science became his work. He now has more than 10 years of experience as an environmental campaigner, focusing on creating strategies for sustainable development supporting local and indigenous environmental activist groups and international environmental and cultural exchanges. Rinchinov has participated in several US-Russian environmental exchange programs and is currently researching how to restart these exchanges after a long pause. Christian? Yeah, thanks a lot for our representation. I'm actually in the US walking in this uh, perfect uh, summer weather, kind of summer for Russia. Uh, visiting for a business now to manage some things with my non-profit. Uh, so I don't have a nice presentation, but I have a message to say. Uh, Elizabeth explained uh, the overview of uh, environmental movement in Russia, like from outside, and I will try to explain shortly my way and uh, my point of view inside and from outside in both times. So as I told before, I came uh, as a teenager in uh, 2000 year when Putin came, uh, when Putin started to be a president and he, one of the first things uh, that he started to do that uh, he started to destroy uh, government environmental services and uh, government uh, environmental laws. So, Greenpeace Russia started campaign uh, of like a referendum, like a voting against of this change. And uh, as a young involved uh, schoolboy, I came to support this campaign. And after a few years, I started to work part time with Greenpeace and uh, another nonprofits. And uh, now I came where I am right now. Uh, so I was born in St. Petersburg. Uh, it's the western part of Russia, and the uh, first years of my environmental way started in uh, European Russia, but uh, 
My grandfather is an indigenous people from Lake Baikal. He is a part of Hamnigan and uh, Buracha uh, nations. So when I'm, after a few years of my uh, teenager environmental experience, uh, I also started to research about uh, my past generations. And uh, I came to the lake, to the Lake Baikal. And uh, I found that, okay, this is my place. This will be my main part of work in my environmental way. So by this way, I started with a big nonprofit like Greenpeace uh, WWF. And then I came to work, uh, to work with a local small nonprofit like Burat Regional Union on Lake Baikal. Uh, and after, after a few years also, when I started to visit uh, my American relatives and uh, got a green card, I uh, found that, that perfect way to continue to work in our present uh, difficult conditions is to work from inside and from outside uh, both. So I, uh, last year I opened uh, my nonprofit here, called by Gali, that can be translated like, uh, like uh, the nature or uh, the environment in a few uh, uh, Eastern Siberian languages, like in Brecha and Mongolian languages. So, uh, it was a short explanation of my, my long way. Uh, so, uh, Elizabeth told about uh, kind of kind of difficult things is, is things in uh, our movement. So, main thing that uh, I want to tell you that the uh, Russian environmental movement uh, is uh, still very big and very wide, but very different. So, uh, in present history, environmental movement started not uh, not only the moment of Chernobyl. It started uh, much more earlier, when a uh, large pipeline factory on Lake Baikal started to work. Uh, about uh, I, I think about seventies. About 70s, there was a first big protests uh, again against uh, this uh, pipeline factory because uh, it was uh, one of the main uh, polluters for the lake. So it's uh, difficult to imagine, but in Soviet in Soviet uh, Union in 70s we got our first uh, environmental protest in Russia. So. Uh, present environmental activism is a little bit uh, older than Chernobyl. Uh, but then, uh, as uh, Anatoly explained, when uh, Russia finally became Russia again and uh, started to be open country again, uh, collaboration with the uh, United States uh, finally started. And uh, because of this support, we got a rise of uh, a lot of different nonprofits. Uh, some of them, most part of them, uh, started by some academic, uh, academical scientists because uh, it was a main process in the persons in the movement. And another part was started by uh, people who came from, uh, sorry, how to translate. So in, in any university, there was a kind of a group of environmental volunteers. It was a Soviet Union practi practice to uh, support the environmental inspectors uh, of the government. So part of our movement come, come from academic scientists and part of movement uh, started from this uh, volunteers of uh, university. So then after uh, Perestroika, uh, there was a rising of nonprofits, and uh, till Putin came, it was really like a gold times for a rise of nonprofits. But uh, then difficult times came, and uh, we got a whole situation with separation for like environmental part of movement and political part of movement. Uh, and then things uh, became really like really separated for uh, many, many, many streams. For example, because of uh, Russian propaganda, um, a lot of people 
in deep Russia who have no internet, but by, but uh, they're watching TV, uh, they finally realized that the uh, government are, are lying to them, that uh, Putin is uh, not a good president. And from, from one side, they uh, stopped to, uh, that, that they stopped to believe to Putin's promise, uh, promises. And from another side, because of uh, government propaganda, they are still thinking that uh, nonprofits are spies and uh, foreign agents. And uh, when this kind of people uh, got environmental issues in their, their local area, they are have a big problem because they are not sure who can support them because they are not believe government and they are not believe uh, nonprofits because uh, they're thinking that uh, nonprofits are spies. It's a very difficult situation that uh, finally started to be managed uh, just now because the internet goes wider and uh, people started to realize that environmental or nonprofits are not spies, that we are doing same things uh, that they want to do just to protect our lands. Uh, but this kind of separation was difficult for nonprofits because uh, this things brings us to the point where our nonprofit uh, separated to two, uh, like for two parts of the movement that uh, stay mm -hmm. far from each other. So one part is uh, professional environmental workers, uh, like members mm -hmm. of uh, nonprofits and uh, academic scientists for environmental science from one side. And uh, people who just get environmental issue in uh, their own area and they are trying to manage the situation. So we got these two different sides of the movement. And uh, for local people, it's sometimes difficult to connect with the uh, nonprofits because of they they are difficult to start to believe so uh, for uh, for each people. And from an uh, environmental moment, it's a little bit difficult to work with uh, some really hard cases because, uh, as my colleagues explained before, uh, now nonprofits uh, should be should try to be safer than before, and uh, they are not trying. They are trying not to touch really hot and danger cases. Uh, and this brings us to another thing that I want to tell you, that in Russia, people also are always uh, thinking that to change something, they have to be a part of something. But uh, in reality, we have to work to bring people to the point where, we, where they will think that uh, human can change, uh, can change situation, not like a nonprofit or government, not a group of people, but any human, any, any citizen have enough rights to change situation. We just have to manage our institutes and, and uh, processes to make this thing work. work. So uh, with this thing, what I'm to do right now, uh, most part of work uh, for me, uh, for three years right now, I am helping local people of Lake Baikal area to protect uh, their forests. And uh, when all this uh, repression things started to go, uh, firstly, I think that, okay, uh, the campaign will be like under the name of uh, my Russian nonprofit. Then I started, I started to think, uh, okay, the uh, campaign will be under the name of my US nonprofit. But then I realized that it's much better and safer if uh, people will represent their work as a people. And from one side, it will be safer for them and safer for uh, my work. And uh, these people who, who are supported by me and my nonprofit and uh, funds that were I get, uh, these people 
knows that uh, they have a support for Indicas for me, but uh, they are getting experience how to work uh, independently. And uh, this is the main thing, the, uh, the, to give them funds, to uh, teach them how to work independently and uh, just let them fly and uh, let them protect uh, their lands with this experience. First okay, time with Christian, our can we ask you then... to wrap up? This is great, yeah, but can sorry. we ask you to wrap up just in the interest of time? Yeah, thanks a lot. Okay, okay, thank you. And, and thanks for being our our um, yeah, I'm ready for any question. speaker Thank to um, talk to us from outside. And now I am going to introduce our last speaker, Laura Henry, who is a professor in the Department of Government and Legal Studies at Bowdoin College in Maine. Her research investigates Russia's post-Soviet transformation and changing state society relations with a particular focus on social activism, environmental politics, and climate policy. Her most recent work, compares how Russian NGOs engage in global governance institutions with their counterparts in China, Brazil, India, and South Africa. Henry is the co-author of Bringing Global Governance Home, NGO Mediation in BRICS States, published recently in 2021 by Oxford University Press. And she is the author of Red to Green, Environmental Activism in Post-Soviet Russia, published in 2010 by Cornell. Um, she's also the co-editor of Russian Civil Society, A Critical Assessment, and has published articles in environmental politics, global environmental politics, post-Soviet affairs, Europe, Asia studies, and other journals. She's been a Watson Fellow and a Fulbright Scholar. Her research has received support from the National Security Education Program, the Social Science Research Council, um, IREX, and the National Council for Eurasian and East European Research. Laura. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm just very pleased to be here with this distinguished company. Um, I've had the opportunity to work with several people um, in the past on these panels, and it is just truly an honor to be here with all of you. Let's see, I'm having a little trouble sharing my slides after all of this, which is silly, but let me try again. Um, so I wanted to talk to you today. I'm building on the work of some of the other folks who have already presented today. And in fact, I'm gonna present on a paper that Elizabeth Planton and I recently completed that's forthcoming in post-Soviet affairs. And maybe Elizabeth can even actually throw up the link in, in the chat. I, will, I don't have the scenic background of Christian, so I apologize for that, but I'll move through it briskly so we have a fair bit of time for a Q&A. So Elizabeth and I both have carried out independent research in Russia on environmental activism. And we had a shared curiosity that was developing over time as some of the environmental activists we had worked with actually had made the very difficult decision to leave Russia and to go into exile. And as scholars, we wondered, how does that affect their activism? You know, what, what, is, what is the trajectory of activism in exile? Um, and as many of you know, we've had great evidence to this uh, fact from all of our panelists so far. The space for environmental activism in Russia and activism of all sorts has been contracting, certainly since 2011-12, and I think another repressive turn around 2018-2019. And some Russians have left the country. These are statistics from the United States of asylum applications, so people who are seeking political asylum. We know that the numbers of migrants are actually quite a bit higher. The migrants to the EU are higher than the US. This is a um, more kind of informal study that attempts to aggregate multiple sources of data and shows hundreds of thousands of Russians having left during Vladimir Putin's presidency each year, totaling about 5 million people. Now, while of course much of this migration is ac actually economic in nature, some of it is political. And from the regime's perspective, the exit of activists could be seen as a safety valve. In a way, it siphons off pressure from the domestic public sphere. The government rids itself of some of the most critical voices. But as we've witnessed, emigrating from Russia doesn't necessarily mean that you give up your role as an environmental advocate uh, for causes back at home, even though you are in exile. So to explore this, we developed a research project um, where we thought a little bit about how do activists in exile continue their activism from abroad? And what are the new opportunities that emerge? And then what are the obstacles to actually um, continuing this work? Uh, and what does it mean? What is the fact that 
that a number of the most prominent uh, environmental activists are emigrating, what does it mean for those who stay behind? Now, in order to do this work, we adopted a theoretical framework that many of you will be familiar with. It's um, Albert Hirschman's idea of exit voice and loyalty. And you might know that Hirschman originally developed this these sort of heuristic devices to discuss consumer dissatisfaction with a firm, but they're so useful that they've been applied in many different ways to transnational migration, to the end of authoritarian regimes, and to contentious politics in general. So exit would mean either withdrawing from the political sphere or emigrating from the country. And voice would mean actually vocalizing your demands and grievances to the state to press for change. And both of those are conditions by loyalty to the, to the existing political order. So at first it was thought that perhaps there was a tension between exit and voice. They, there was, you had to make a choice, there was an alternative. But over time, more and more scholars have recognized that in fact, in some cases, exit and voice can go together. So we look at activists in exile, people who have engaged in activism in their home country, but were targeted by the regime for their activism and forced to flee for fear of politically motivated persecution. And to do that work, and I am gonna move briskly here, we uh, did in-depth interviews with six high profile environmental and indigenous activists who have left Russia. They all left Russia during Putin's third term as president. So between uh, 2012 and 2018, and we're very grateful to these individuals for sharing their stories. I'll introduce them briefly. So we have Nadezhda Kuchepova from Planet of Hopes. Um, Kuchepova is the founder of an NGO that provided legal assistance to victims of the Mayak nuclear disaster, and she was based in Chelyabinsk. Continuing across the top row, somebody you've already been introduced to today, Yevgenia Chirikova, who was the leader of the Save Himki Forest movement, um, who's currently living in Estonia, and Kuchepov is currently living in Paris. Then at the end of the top row, we have Alexei Kozlov, who was a human rights and environmental activist from Voronezh, um, who worked on a whole host of different political issues. In the bottom row, on the bottom left, we have Søren Gazarin, who is a scientist um, who became an activist during the run-up to the Sochi Winter Olympics, who was working on environmental conservation and protected lands. Then we have Pablo Sulanziga in the middle of the bottom row, who um, has ha worn many hats. He, for years, was a vice president of RAIPAN, which is the Russian Association of Indigenous Peoples of the North. Um, but he also has an NGO, the International Indigenous Fund, Batani. He's a member of the Urge people um, from the Russian Far East. And then finally, Dmitry Berzhkov, um, who's now the head of an NGO called Aborigen Forum, but who used to work at RIPON with Pavel. And we matched these six in-depth case studies with two activists who remained in Russia, and I'll talk to you about that briefly. Now, alas, we don't have time to go into all the fascinating details of the stories of these individuals, how they made their decision to emigrate, what the consequences were for them personally and professionally. But I want to draw out just a couple of generalizations that we can think about moving forward. We found that, of course, a departure from Russia may be planned or it may be sudden. And actually, interestingly, of our six in-depth case studies, three activists had developed a plan for leaving the country if necessary, even as they hoped never to use it, while the other three left very abruptly after a precipitating event that propelled them into exile. Three of our activists, Sulanziga, Gazarian, and Kuchepova, were involved in NGOs that were targeted by the 2012 foreign agent law. Several of them faced either criminal charges or the threat of criminal charges for their activism during this time period. And in addition to concerns about their personal safety or their personal liberty, several of the activists, actually four of them, cited fear for the safety of their relatives or their children as a reason for leaving Russia. Whether their departures were planned or sudden, all of them made use of pre-existing professional ties um, to identify the country that they would emigrate to and to try to make their way in their new home. Now, 
each of these activists has pursued activism in exile in some way. And it's a, it's a mixed picture, but it's really notable that they all have continued to try to maintain their voice. And they've discovered some new opportunities for activism abroad. Uh, in several of the cases, we see activists actually either reviving or revitalizing an NGO that had been declared a foreign agent or you know, was um, languishing, or creating a new organization as a platform for their continued activism. We also see increasing use of digital activism and digital platforms for connecting with uh, people back in Russia and for trying to develop coalitions. So the most interesting example of this, I think, is Yevgenia Cherkova, who has um, a platform called Aktivatika, um, which is a place where activists inside and outside Russia can share information about their challenges, their grievances, what they're doing about it, what events they're holding. Um, they can post pictures, video, make announcements. So that's a really interesting way of continuing to contribute to the movement. We also see that activists in exile may actually have greater access to media outlets, to independent media outlets, where they can publicize their stories and, um, uh, and gain public attention and awareness for the issues that they want to discuss. Now, that said, we, sh we must recognize that there are also, of course, some pretty severe obstacles to voice after exit. Going into exile is personally and professionally disorienting. It's a tremendous challenge to think about your legal status, to think about whether you have a residency permit, a work permit, to potentially apply for asylum, to adapt to a new language, to try to find paid employment, which may be unrelated to your past professional activities. And some of these activists actually had to leave behind um, family members as they resettled. So naturally this, there's real difficulties there. Now, to think about our cases a little bit more systematically, we did wanna do some paired comparisons and we actually had this tremendous opportunity to pair um, two of our activists in exile with two individuals who chose to stay in the country. Um, and so at the top here, you see on the left, uh, Rodion Sulanziga, who is Pavel Sulanziga's brother. And they had both pursued indigenous rights activism and to a certain degree, environmental activism. Now, Rodion Sulanziga is still in Moscow. He is the head or has been the head of an organization called the Center for the Support of the Indigenous Peoples of the Russian North. And it's interesting to consider kind of some of the things that he's experienced um, by remaining in Russia. So in 2014, as he was leaving to attend a UN roundtable on the rights of indigenous peoples in New York, he had his passport temporarily confiscated and his US visa removed, so he was unable to travel. In addition to which, his organization has been declared a foreign agent and was ordered to be liquidated. And, you know, he remains very active, engaged in education, um, training, and trying to bring people together to coordinate on Indigenous rights. But he talks about being on a knife's edge psychologically and physically, and always having to keep in mind a plan A, B, and C. On the bottom row, we've paired Soren, Soren Gazarian with um, Yevgeny Vitishko, and they were both involved in a movement called an anti dacha movement in the run up to the Sochi Olympics. They were both scientists. Gazarian is studies bats. Um, uh, Vitishko is a geologist, and they were concerned about protected areas that were being developed for the Olympics, and they tried to call attention to that, um, the illegal seizure of public lands, and on some of these public lands, actually, there was the construction of elite dachas. Now, they were both charged with property damage for some graffiti on the fence of one of the dachas. Um, while through a series of events, Gazarin ended up leaving Russia, Vitishko stayed and tried to appeal the charges, but his appeal was denied. And ultimately, Vitishko served 22 months in a penal colony. He was released in December 2015, but only after a prolonged hunger strike and an international campaign for his freedom. So these stories are fascinating and rich, and I can't possibly do justice to them 
here, but we're social scientists, so just very briefly, we tried to think about this, uh, develop a typology, think about the trade-offs of remaining in Russia and being an activist in exile. So when does exit amplify voice? When does exit minimize voice? And so to do this, we disaggregated voice into horizontal and vertical along the lines of that Guillermo O'Donnell suggested in an earlier work. So horizontal is speech and activism directed at other Russian citizens, other activist networks, and vertical voice is directed at the political authorities who are in charge of the issue that you are concerned about. And what we found is, I'll kind of go through these boxes really quickly. For those who uh, did not leave Russia, horizontal voice, constrained le legitimacy, remains very vibrant, right? The ability to have robust connections to activist networks inside Russia, to have on the ground knowledge of the current state of affairs, and to have this greater perceived legitimacy that you remained and are trying to work to advocate for and represent aggrieved citizens. However, these actions you're doing. Laura, I'm sorry, just could we ask you to wrap it up so we have time for Q&A? Yes, absolutely. So I'll just say at the very end that if you look at the upper left and the lower right box, you can see that um, remaining in Russia means that you have strong horizontal voice, um, or sorry, the top, but weak, weaker vertical, and then vice versa. If you leave Russia, you might be able to exert more indirect pressure on the authorities, but you may lose that connection to the domestic environmental movement. Thank you so much. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Laura, and thanks to all our speakers. And now I'm going to turn it over to Sasha, who from NYU's Jordan Center, who will pose the first questions. Sasha? Thanks, Elise. Um, so this is a question I think that probably all of you um, can, can weigh in on. Um, I wanted to ask about the impact that increasing awareness and anxiety surrounding climate change has had on environmental activism in Russia. Um, has it helped uh, environmental movements? Has it harmed environmental movements? And I also was wondering if any of you could touch on um, the element of youth climate activism as we've seen uh, specifically among young people increasing anxiety and awareness and including in Russia and how that is, uh, how youth activists have worked with other activists and whether that's helped or, or harmed movements. Uh, so yeah, thanks very much. Uh, all the presentations were so interesting. Well, I could get started. I know Maria has done some direct work with youth climate activists this summer. So I think she'll definitely want to weigh in. Um, but what I would say is there's really growing awareness of climate change and the risks of climate change, particularly when you get um, beyond the big cities, I think, and people live, you know, in places where climate change is increasingly visible, especially, I think, in the Russian North, where you see issues with the thawing of perma permafrost, infrastructure damage, flooding, um, you know, difficulty with, especially for indigenous peoples with traditional livelihood practices. And so I've been really impressed at how much young people know. And there is a small but very vibrant um, Fridays for the Future movement inside Russia. Some of you might have seen Anastasia Fomina spoke um, down at Swarthmore Bryn Mawr uh, a couple of weeks ago, which was an amazing presentation. So I've been really impressed at the really rising awareness and youth activism, although I have to say some of the methods like solitary picket are really designed to avoid some of the repressive measures that we've discussed. Maria, would you like to jump in? like to add a little bit, just a bit. Uh, I would say that there is a lot of different summer schools and education youth programs on climate. Uh, and I would say that young people are really, really engaged in such activities. So, uh, but I don't see like many new uh, environmental NGOs that would be just focusing on climate change. Uh, there are more like shifting those who were exact, um, for example, exacting uh, um, uh, against garbage um, processing plants or building new infrastructure. They now pick up the uh, top, uh, topics on climate. Can I add something? Yeah, absolutely, Christian. Sure. So uh, I want to say about the uh, climate change movement. Actually, in Russia, we have uh, so many issues, environmental issues and uh, indigenous rights issues and other issues that we have to manage right now. 
uh, and because of this uh, climate change campaign are uh, still be very important and uh, we are doing a lot of uh, things to work uh, with it but we we have to concentrate now on uh, issues that have to be managed right now because uh, if we will lose something uh, from ecosystems and from environmental rights uh, right now if will be it will damage uh, our nature and our indigenous uh, societies and the uh, climate change uh, cl climate uh, situation together so actually to manage these things uh, for russian activists for indigenous activists uh, it's uh, very important to continue uh, exchange programs uh, especially with us that uh, was stopped a few years ago for example uh, now i'm thinking about how to restart the uh, tahu baikau institute and for uh, and uh, for us some other programs so we have a lot of uh, very professional and professional good activists from uh, Central Russia, from uh, Siberia, from uh, Russians, from indigenous people. A lot of young uh, passion, uh, passion professionals who are ready to work, who are want to share their experience, because not only US experience should be shared in Russia, we have uh, our own experience uh, that should be shared in US. So we have to continue this exchange now it's uh, not the best time for funding of uh, this war, but uh, I have to say that uh, it will be very important and uh, hopeful for uh, both countries. Thanks. So I want to kind of build on this by taking a couple of the questions that are in the Q&A right now. Um, one from Kimberly Martin and one from an anonymous attendee, which is to get at the question of the extent to which um, environmental activists in Russia are seen as as the autonomous attendee is, are environmental activists seen in Russia as being anti-patriotic? Is this somehow seen as that because of association with opposition parties, because of just being, uh, you know, pushing back against the government, does being an environmental activist be, make, make you be seen as sort of against Russia's interests? But also what I would like to, would be super interested in is folding into that this second question about this dichotomy between Russia-focused environmental interests like the Kimsky Forest or like Lake Bacal, and the larger kind of global environmental movement, Anatoly, going back to what you were talking about, you know, back in the 70s, being involved with Greenpeace in a sort of larger environmental movement, but now more recently, the question of climate change. And is there, is there any distinction in these two? Like, is, is climate change, activ activity on climate change somehow seen as more patriotic or less anti-patriotic, right, than activity on local issues or vice versa? If you're acting on local issues, does it feel like, okay, that's something that's for Russia, but if you're acting on these climate change issues, that's part of a, a sort of Western agenda. So I'd love to hear from Anatoly and then Elizabeth on that one, and then anyone else who has any comments. Okay, thank you. I would like to answer. It's a really great, great question and absolutely uh, sustained, absolutely um, important. Uh, the point is, uh, the, the question is, uh, priority you know for my perception uh, climate change issue is uh, is sort of a topic uh, which a regular, uh, regular person uh, or uh, any active group cannot influence directly the uh, the point is that <clears throat> we as journalists uh, are working with the key priority which is for siberian forest resource use policy and strategy and um, and model uh, because uh, climate change is a result of unfair resource management unfair territorial management unfair development and <clears throat> as soon as we um, uh, speak about uh, patriotism as you said uh, for us uh, for our uh, um, understanding um, uh, real uh, patriotism for uh, regional governance and uh, local governance is to keep uh, resource management uh, environmentally uh, sustainable and safe enough, and then we'll receive uh, the tool 
to moderate uh, climate change and to keep it in any uh, desirable framework. That's our model of, uh, of uh, education for our target, target group. Our key target group in our campaigning uh, are just regional and local governments officials and um, serious businesses. So that's our target. So I understand the situation like that. Elizabeth? Thank you for the question. I think this is a, a really interesting one and it's one where, so I've also done a lot of work on the foreign agent law. Um, and it's one where I think organizations that got listed as foreign agents were suddenly shocked, right? Because working on Russia's environment, protecting the environment, protecting um, the beautiful flora and fauna that is within Russia was seen as patriotic, right? You can't get more patriotic than that, um, that you're protecting your own green space in your own backyard and, and trying to preserve it for future generations and to honor just how amazing all of that is within Russia. But it's that link to the foreign that really lent itself to an ugly anti-foreign framing of, um, you know, it, it's where that then turns in, into that anti-patriotic frame of, well, you're working with the West or, you know, there's foreign meddling. And unfortunately, I think climate change also lends itself more easily to that kind of frame. Um, to say that, you know, the West or foreign interests are trying to, to keep Russia down or, or you know, um, spoil our ability to use our natural resources or something like that, which is very unfortunate given the fact that, as Laura stated, Russia is facing major impacts from climate change. Um, but from what I had noticed with even talking to Russian environmental activists at some of the top environmental NGOs, there's climate skepticism among some of those activists. There's disinterest in working specifically on climate change. Maybe that is changing um, in the last couple of years. And certainly the, the small but mighty Fridays for Future youth climate activism movement is exciting for that reason. Um, but unfortunately, I think there's, there's this... Um, disconnect between realizing, you know, that this patriotic sort of focusing on Russia's nature could also um, lend itself to working on climate change without that anti-foreign framing. Thank you. Um, I think we have time for one more question, possibly two. I'd like to pose a question from one of the students here at Harriman Institute. Kelly Nathanson, she asks, have you found that packaging or addressing climate change under the larger umbrella of traditional indigenous cultural preservation in Siberia and the Far East makes the government more willing to act on climate issues? Yeah, I have an answer. So in our sure. work in the Lake Baikal region, uh, our local ind indigenous uh, people who are uh, environmental activists, uh, they are realizing that uh, protection of their local forest is a part of uh, balancing of uh, climate change. So there are not a kind of people who are uh, come any Sunday to the center of the city and uh, spending their time like climate change, climate change. They're working in their own place, doing real work in small place and that uh, becoming a part of a large process of preserving ecosystems as a part of uh, balancing of climate change. So in uh, my case of work, indigenous activists uh, who I work uh, with, they're realizing this, that uh, this is important. And the uh, most important thing that uh, they can do is to, uh, to manage everything in their area and uh, if any spot of the earth will, will be responsibly managed like this, everything will be okay. So for us, it's like this, thanks. Can I add a little bit? Yeah, I would say that on the contrary, like, uh, the NGOs try not to package it under climate change, but to do their own work 
um, uh, on the grants which are uh, given for climate change. You know, for example, any sustainability project and any low carbon initiatives uh, contributes to combating climate change. And so they are trying to, uh, for the funders to frame it in a way that application uh, project, project application asks and continue their work on the local level, which also, of course, um, uh, helping to adjust uh, to the climate change, to combat the climate change or to diminish climate change. Thank you. Uh I just want to add real briefly that actually the, the site of a lot of the oil and gas extraction overlaps with indigenous traditional territories and that actually creates a confrontation unfortunately rather makes it in some cases even more challenging. Okay, well, unfortunately we're out of time. Um, this has been a fascinating discussion, and we got a lot of good questions very much at the last seconds in the in the in the chat. So I think we'll have to have another session on environmentalism as uh, you know, environmental activism as well. And we'll look forward to welcoming you all back to the Jordan Center again, and to Harriman and to the New York City Russia Public Policy in the future. I just want to give a heads up that we have our next New York City Russia Public Policy series will be on March 23rd. We are deliberately uh, keeping that topic open for the moment due to the evolving nature of current events. Um, but we will hope to see many of you there uh, when we reconvene in March for our next session. And we'll be in touch and we'll publicize uh, what we're going to do. So I want to just thank the panelists. I want to thank Sasha again for organizing this and, and pass it over to Elise for the final word. Yeah, thank you. I just want to echo uh, what Josh said. Thank you so much to our speakers for participating today. And this is such an important topic that we'll definitely uh, be taking up again. Um, and thanks to everyone for coming. Thank thanks. you all. Bye. Bye. Thank thanks you. so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. See you in March. Mm -hmm.